Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Welcome to the show, everybody. You know, many experts today compare our current economy with that of the Great Depression or the time period around World War II. Millions of families are still feeling the financial effects due to the economic downturn of 2008. But a lot of us don't stop to think about how our children perceive the situation. Do they perceive it as this gray period in history or do they perceive it as something else? Well, we're going to sit down with professional writer and author of the book Air Raid Nights and Radio Days. Uh, we're going to sit down with Don Schrader, everybody. Very unique book. And the subline is Hanging On for Dear Life. It's actually a book written about that time period, but from a, a very young child's perspective. It's very interesting. We're excited to have him on the show. Don't go anywhere. I also have our co-host, Margaret Bush, will be with us. We have an amazing show. We'll be right back. Come experience Nolan's, savor award-winning steaks, Greek-style cuisine, fresh local seafood, and an extensive choice of wines. Whether you'd like to reserve the large private dining room, enjoy a meal on an outdoor deck, or rock the night away in our lounge, Nolan's, now celebrating 25 years of exceeding your expectations for casual fine dining, live entertainment, and dancing nightly. Welcome back. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in. I'm here with my lovely co-host, Miss Margo Bush. Margo, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. <laughs> You're doing good? I'm going doing good. Okay. Going. Well, Margo, I'm excited to have you back. It seems like I see you a lot. Well, we work a lot together, and so, you know. Well, and the, the reason I wanted you to co host, particularly on this episode, is because our guest tonight is a professional writer and author, and I know that's kind of your wheelhouse, right. uh, having a background in publishing. You've been a publisher for almost 15 years now. Almost 15 years. Yeah. So, this is really, you're yeah. going to know everything you got No, the, that's the thing, is that after you've been a publisher for 15 years, you pretty much know. I mean, I can take a printer apart. That's how, yeah. that's how well I know it. So you know all aspects, the writing side of it, yeah. the technical side, layout. And we have a lot of young uh, and new authors, and so you learn how to help them get through the process. And uh, it takes a lot of time to just, you, you try to get help for them yeah. and, and tips and help them write better. And, and they always usually want to have, uh, write another book. A lot of them there aren't just one book, and a lot of children's authors, too, yeah. that, that want to have a series. And so... And I think in the beginning, too, writing a book, it seems like such a big commitment, you know? It, obviously, it's on most people's bucket list that one day we're going to write a book, but the process of writing, you know, authoring a book and becoming an author seems like this ginormous task in life. And really, when you do it on a day-to-day -day basis as yourself, it's really not a big deal. And I know a lot of authors... I mean, it's a big deal, but the it process is. itself is not as it's daunting not. as and it may I seem. And I love what I tell young authors because they're just like, oh, my gosh, how am I going to get all the way through this? And I said, if you just think about writing a book, that it's the, every chapter is l like a really long email. And once I say that, they just go, oh, okay. Yeah. Because there's a lot of people that can write a really long email. And that's usually a chapter. So yeah. once it's bound into book size, that's and all right. That. Because you know, so a twelve chapter book would be oh, roughly yeah. sixty pages, let's say. Right. Something like that. Right. And so when you break it down like that for for them, it just makes it manageable. It helps them to understand that it's just not a huge process. And really, they want to get their story out. They want to get their feelings out. They want to get it out on paper. And we want them to. And there's some tremendous. I'm telling you, you know, we've had some unbelievable stories. Yeah. People I met amazing to, people. I'm telling you. Well, and you know, speaking of amazing, the guest tonight, he actually didn't reach out to us. I'm the one that actually reached out to him because uh, I was actually downtown uh, at a festival, and I, I actually ran across uh, our, our author, this author, and I, I got I, I, the book, just the graphics of the book caught my eye. 
And um, I, we, we started a brief conversation. And he kind of told me a little bit about what the book was about. And, of course, uh, supporting local authors. And I bought right. the book. And uh, sad to you. say, I kind of shelved it. I didn't get into it right away. And then I had a little extra time. And I said, you know, I'm not going to pay for a book that I'm not going to read. And I started going through it. And I got to tell you, I was so enthralled about this book because it does cover uh, much of that time period from the Great Depression through World War II. And, uh, but it's written really from a young person's perspective. And, and I, I got to say, it really got me thinking about, you know, what your children pick up on. As you know, I have a five-year-old and I started thinking like, does he see the things I'm dealing with the same way? And, you know, maybe if I was asked to author a book years from now about this current time we're in now, that would be a very different book, I think, that from, from my five-year-old writing the book. Right. And it really makes you think about what our children are seeing and how they perceive things. So I'm, I'm excited, really, to bring out uh, our next guest, Don Schrader, everybody. <laughs> Don, it's great to have you. Don, I got to tell you, I was just telling Margo that, uh, uh, you know, and I'm sure this happens a lot, but... Um, I bought, uh, we met downtown, you probably don't re remember because uh, I'm not that memorable a person, you probably, but I do remember meeting you briefly and I, you signed my book and at that time I had a lot going on, I kind of shelved it and I would look at it when I'm getting ready in the morning like that book, when I get time I'm going to read that book and we had spoke just briefly enough where you could kind of just give me a very basic overview of what the book was about and I was, just from that I was intrigued enough to know that when I get time, I'm going to read this. And I have to say, just flipping through it uh, initially, uh, within minutes, I was really brought into the story because it's something that's very personal to me. My father lived uh, during much of this time. And, you know, I, I teach uh, a lot of personal coaching and gets into a lot of financial uh, coaching as well. And, you know, a lot of our current situation right now is likened to that of the time of the Great Depression or uh, the time surrounding World War II. And of course, we know that r after World War II was actually good for the economy. There was a real industry boom uh, right. that kind of brought things back with, with Roosevelt. But, um, but a really captivating book. First of all, obviously, you, you, we talked about it. You, you've been a professional writer for many years, um, and I know you're a writer and author now. But tell us a little bit about your background and how you got started and where you're from. Well, I grew up in Indiana, and uh, I went to Indiana University, and as a freshman, I didn't know what I was going to do. And I uh, had a friend who was in journalism, and he suggested that that would be a good career. Uh, and then that summer, I took a summer school uh, class in uh, uh, writing. And uh, uh, I wrote a memoir, actually, one of the memoirs, it's uh, Memories, it's mm -hmm. in the book. Uh, and uh, he took me aside afterwards and he said that I really have a gift for writing and I ought to consider possibly writing as a career. And so that was kind of turned me in that direction. So really, it's okay, I guess, if we're in college now, we still don't know exactly what we're going to do. It's okay, a lot of people still don't. And after that point, you made the decision to become a writer. Um, let's take a quick break. I want to talk a little bit more about your career. I know you wrote for several newspapers as well um, before authoring the book. But I also want to get to this book because personally, this really spoke to me. So let's take a short break. We'll be right back with Don Schrader in a minute. Don't go anywhere. Real estate today offers incredible opportunities, low prices, and extremely low interest rates. Hi, I'm Amy Norris from Amy Sells the Beach. Right now, there are opportunities in all areas. Our team can help you put your money to work finding your dream or investment property. And if you're looking to sell, no one can give you better exposure to buyers and make your property stand out. Experience matters when looking for opportunity. I'm Amy Norris. See why we're number one at amysellsthebeach.com. When visiting Gulf Shores, Alabama, make sure to visit the Gulf Coast Zoo, home of the little zoo that could from Animal Planet. Get up close in our petting zoo. Enjoy our unique animal encounters. More than 300 monkeys, bears, reptiles, big cats, parrots, and more call a Gulf Coast home. Come on, go wild at the Alabama Gulf Coast Zoo.
Welcome back. Welcome back. I'm here with author Don Schrader. Now, Don, uh, we were talking about the book. You had gotten out of college, and uh, somebody had said, you know, you, you'd be a great writer. You wrote a short story or memoir, and then they, you said, hey, why don't you think about writing? And, you know, I, I talk to people about that all the time. You know, we, I've been with Margo a long time. We've been coaching for many years on her publishing company. And I believe, I don't know if you agree with this, I believe that you're either supposed to be a writer or you're not. I, I, don't, I think anybody could actually go through classes and author a, a decent book, but they're not necessarily a writer. And it, my opinion, like, like many things, you either ha it's in your blood and you're supposed to be a writer or you're not supposed to be a writer. And if you have it, what you have can be polished quickly, but it's not for everybody. Would you agree with that? I, I would agree with it. But I also think uh, writing takes a lot of practice. Yeah. Uh, you, you're not born able to write. It's like anything else. It may be a talent, but it has to be developed. Developed. And uh, obviously writing is very therapeutic. So we don't want to discourage people from becoming authors um, because sometimes they're going through different periods in their life where it's just almost necessary uh, for some people to put it down. Good and point. of course, a lot of those books become very successful. Now, uh, you, you mentioned in your childhood, you, you kind of didn't know exactly what you wanted to do. You go through college, you start writing. Tell us a little bit about, before you started authoring books, what was your job uh, like? Well, my first job out of uh, college, I worked for the South Bend Tribune. And then I went into the Army for a while. And after the Army, I worked for two newspapers, uh, the Dayton Journal Herald and the Columbus Citizen Journal. Neither one of them are in existence anymore, yeah. <laughs> but they were good papers at the time. And um, I uh, uh, was offered a job in public relations with the old Bell system. I uh, started out with Indiana Bell, and I also worked with AT&T in New York City. And all, always in writing, uh, I, I, everything I did at least started with writing. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me ask you, in going through this book, uh, it seemed like it was maybe a little bit autobiographical. I mean, is it based on you? Yes, uh, it's, or it's similar. Care, a friend, or it's uh, my memoirs, and uh, it's it's all true. Although I had to, uh, as I say, round out the corners because I couldn't remember all the details. Yeah. but it's true. It's it's uh, memories about uh, growing up uh, during World War II, and. Uh, uh, life on the home front at the time, and then into the into the 1950s and and the recovery and how life was so much better after the war. Well, and there's a lot of humor in the book, which I appreciate because a lot of those stories and anecdotes it's very relatable and it's easy to absorb because you did use a lot of humor. But one point that I really got from the book is a child's imagination. I mean, their uh, imagination is just, sometimes you don't know uh, where that line is of imagination and reality. And that's a really refreshing thing to see uh, coming from a child's perspective. Well, uh, I didn't write this, but uh, I'd like to read uh, just a few lines from the foreword yeah. because I think it says a lot about the book. Air Raid Nights and Radio Days is an exciting slice of life I could not put down. Whether the reader is from the older generation, like the author, reliving World War II blackouts and polio breakouts, or my younger generation, learning about daily ice delivery, rag merchants, and cootie catchers, this anecdotal, fast-moving journey through middle America is eye-opening. It will simultaneously bring laugh out loud and eye-watering moments. Yeah. Well, and that, that is, I, I did find myself, <laughs> very few things to can do that, but I actually found myself cracking up because <laughs> as having a five-year-old now, I can imagine my son doing a lot of the things that you wrote about. But there is a few very touching stories on there, in there that, um, uh, like the part about the man beating the, the mule, and you knew that that mule would never stand again. I mean, there's right. some stuff in there that uh, was very fitting to that period in history. Well, it was, and uh, I think basically uh, people were very caring at that time. I, I suppose they still are, but they, in those days they realized that uh, uh, every neighbor needed another neighbor, and if you were uh, 
a father or mother of children, you, you knew that you had a special obligation to take care of them because the school wasn't going to take care of them and society wasn't. It was up to you. And there was a lot of love. And uh, if people had problems, others uh, rushed to help them. And I really appreciated how you were able to put uh, the reader right in the position because I started thinking like, well, this was a long time ago. How could he really remember these events? But, you know, it's interesting. And I, I actually teach, give a talk on this, um, the way that your brain files information. Sometimes if you ask somebody, you know, what would you have for lunch two weeks ago? It would almost be impossible to try to recall something that simple. But when we are in front of something that we view as very serious or maybe even world changing or traumatizing, that gets filed into a different part of our brain that you can recall for life. And I would think even in my generation, something like 9-11, you know, I can't remember what I had last week for lunch, but I know exactly where I was during 9-11 because we viewed that as a very uh, life-changing event. And everybody I've ever talked to can also recall uh, their event as well. That's true. And it's true of uh, things that happened in, in earlier times. Uh, I remember exactly what I was doing and so forth when I heard that President Kennedy yeah. had been assassinated. And older people uh, remember uh, exactly what they were doing when uh, they heard about the Japanese attack of Pearl, Pearl Harbor. Harbor yeah. And I was alive then, but I think I was like five years old, so I don't yeah. remember. Well, I, we're going to take a, a quick break, but be, when we come back, I want to read briefly just my favorite part of this book because, uh, again, I could hardly set this thing down. I buy a lot of books. I'm an avid reader, but this really spoke to me, and I want to go over that real quick. When we come back, we're going to take a quick break, and we're going to try to sell you a bunch of stuff, and then we'll be right back with uh, Don Schrader, everybody. Real Estate Today offers incredible opportunities, low prices, and extremely low interest rates. Hi, I'm Amy Norris from Amy Sells the Beach. Right now, there are opportunities in all areas. Our team can help you put your money to work finding your dream or investment property. And if you're looking to sell, no one can give you better exposure to buyers and make your property stand out. Experience matters when looking for opportunity. I'm Amy Norris. See why we're number one at amysellsthebeach.com. Hi, I'm Dan Vega, entrepreneur and host of the Gulf Coast's favorite new talk show, Tuesdays with Dan. Join us every Tuesday where we come together and share success principles that will not only help you in your business, but in your personal life. Don't worry, this isn't some boring business talk show. It's an opportunity not only to hear from your favorite entrepreneurs and celebrity guests, but to receive real value every week. Check us out late night after Jimmy Kimmel and The Insider or at 8 a.m. on My35. You won't want to miss it. Come experience Nolan's. Savor award-winning steaks. Greek-style cuisine, fresh local seafood, and an extensive choice of wines. Whether you'd like to reserve the large private dining room, enjoy a meal on an outdoor deck, or rock the night away in our lounge, Nolan's, now celebrating 25 years of exceeding your expectations for casual fine dining, live entertainment, and dancing nightly. Thank you. I'm here with uh, author Don Schrader, Air Raid Nights and Radio Days, Hanging On For Dear Life. And I'll tell you, you're going to be hanging on to this book once you get it. And uh, I want to ask you a quick question. We got into um, the obvious uh, Kilroy here on the cover. Many people recognize that. You want to explain a little bit about that and what made you decide to put it on the book? Well, Kilroy is uh, really the icon of World War II. And um, the GIs started... Uh, uh, drawing this guy and they they drew him and painted him on tanks and jeeps and on buildings and walls all through Europe as as they were winning the war and we kids back home thought it was neat too and, and we drew uh, Kilroy and underneath it just like the GIs we uh, wrote Kilroy was here right right we thought they that was a... really pretty neat stuff well, I wanted to read this part. Uh, I couldn't set it down, and uh, this part w really brought a lot of laughter to me because, you know, having a five-year-old, a, a child's imagination is, you know, sometimes my son speaks to me as a superhero, and then he's like, Dad, when I'm doing this, and it's really almost at times crossing that line into reality because it's, and it's so refreshing to see an imagination uh, mm -hmm. like that. But it says here, um, this was on uh, 36, it says, um, 
After school, uh, Benny, Dick, and I prowled the neighborhood looking to shoot dead anything or anybody who remotely uh, resembled Hitler or his soldiers. Sometimes Fred joined us. I'm sure at the time all over the radio that was the propaganda about Hitler. It says, we wore civilian clothing so nobody would suspect us being soldiers. During warm weather, we wore short pants, uh, gray ankle-high sneakers, and short sleeve shirts. Our long rifles were cleverly disguised as sticks. Despite our non-threatening appearance, our assaults uh, brought terror and awe to the faces of the enemy. A man wearing a black shirt, an obvious Nazi, uh, and patrolling with a German shepherd jumped in fear from our loud frontal attack. We withdrew rapidly before he could call uh, for backup or even release his barking dog. And it says, we use hunks of soft orange brick or chalk to draw Kilroy was here, uh, symbols on sidewalks, walls, and garages, uh, just like the American soldiers. But it's fun, you know, you actually are thinking our guns, does, uh, you know, <laughs> hidden as sticks instead of, I mean, that's really encompasses, I think, a child's imagination. Well, uh, kids had a lot of imagination. I think kids always do. Uh, somebody said that we had more imagination in those days because radio uh, fired our imagination. We, we had to uh, picture what was going on right. in our head when Fibber McGee and Molly was on or Inner Sanctum or Jack Benny or what have you. Uh, but uh, kids were interested in reading this book to find out that way back then, just like now, uh, families gathered in their living rooms. Of course, they didn't have family rooms back then. And instead of watching television, which uh, wasn't around, they sat there and listened to the radio and actually watched the radio yeah, while sure. these programs were on. Well, and I hear that from my own son so many times of like, we could be doing something and then within 30 seconds of stopping, I'll say, Dad, I'm bored. <laughs> and, and really, our society is so fast paced and there's so much going on that they have, feel like they have to be stimulated every second. But, you know, you make a good point about it, imagination. I remember just as, as a child growing up in the 70s and 80s that, you know, you couldn't get me indoors to play video games. I wanted to be outside all the time. And today it seems like these kids are not wanting to go outside. They're not creating their own fun. And, and uh, certainly we have many more things today that kids can get involved with. But there was a, a great part in the book that talking about making your own fun. And it said, you know, every week or whatever, we'd go down to this place because we knew that we were going to, somebody was bringing their mule, and we knew we were going to get to see a mule today. <laughs> you know, so talk about create your own fun, definitely yeah. different times. It was a big time, and the, the high point of the week was when the ice man came, and we got to climb on the back of the ice wagon yeah. to get a chunk of ice to gnaw on, but we never did it until he was out of sight, because we weren't sure whether we were stealing it or not. Of course, he always uh, made sure there were plenty of chunks for us to, to grab. Well, and, uh, you know, why do you feel like, I mean, you, you, the book, obviously, you, you, hang, you held on to these memories for many years, but what really prompted you to write the book? Tell us why you feel it's so important to get this book out. Well, I, I think that uh, a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, my generation uh, has so much to be thankful for, especially to the greatest generation. They were the ones that came before us, and they uh, not only gave us life, but they protected our liberty. And then they came home and opened up uh, countless opportunities for the pursuit of happiness. They were hard workers, ingenuity, had a lot of ingenuity. And we ha all have so much to be thankful to for them. So I hope that comes through in the book. Yeah. Uh, also, um, we were called the silent generation or the passive generation. Not a very nice thing to say about a generation but it's true. We didn't have any student movement. We didn't complain about life as we found it. Uh, when we were young kids, things w were tough. But as we got older, life got better and better yeah. and better. So we, we ought to be called the thankful generation. Yeah. Thankful to the, the greatest generation. Well, and many of the kids, they thought, you know, they didn't even know they were poor. You, you said, we were so poor. We knew we were poor. But there was a lot of kids that they, they didn't even know they were poor. They were out there. They were having fun. And I know we were talking a little bit backstage, and you said that you'll go to these book signings, and you'll talk to people that live through this era, and they'll talk about, you know, living through some of the toughest times in American history. But at the same time, they say, you know, we're so fortunate 
to be raised and born um, because it was the greatest time on earth, uh, the greatest time ever. That's what they tell me, and I agree. We were so fortunate to, to have lived through those times and to be born when we were because this period of American history that we've lived through has been fantastic. And, of course, I, I believe that uh, you and I and everybody out there won the lottery when we were blessed to be Americans. So. It was a great book. I was really inspired. I think this should be almost a mandatory read for, for young adults and children in school. I give them a little piece of, of our history. Uh, and uh, again, it was a great. Where can people buy the book, Don? Well, uh, they can uh, go to any bookstore and order it uh, through the bookstore yep. just by the name, Air Raid Nights and Radio Days. And if they, anyone wanting a signed copy can contact us uh, on our email address, which is I-N-F-L-H-S, like in Florida High School, at AOL.com, and be happy to mail them uh, a, a copy of either a hardback or a regular back copy. Okay, well, there you have it. It's available in bookstores across the country. Thank you so much, Don, for stopping Thank by. You. It was a real pleasure. Uh, Don Schrader, everybody. <laughs> Great book. Must read. you got to pick it up. That's our show. We're out of time. Don't get, forget to get involved in your local community. Be forgiving of others. Good night, everybody. Hi, I'm Dan Vega entrepreneur and host of the Gulf Coast's favorite new talk show, Tuesdays with Dan. Join us every Tuesday where we come together and share success principles that will not only help you in your business, but in your personal life. Don't worry, this isn't some boring business talk show. It's an opportunity not only to hear from your favorite entrepreneurs and celebrity guests, but to receive real value every week. Check us out late night after Jimmy Kimmel and The Insider or at 8 a.m. on My35. You won't want to miss it.